Kyle Whittingham is saying many a things about realignment. Do these remarks have any merit to them? You are locked on college football. Your daily podcast on all things college football. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On College Football. I am your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view every day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day in your daily source to stay up to date with the biggest stories in the greatest sport on planet Earth, realignment, coaching carousel, the portal, and more. Getting you ready for the season, which is, oh, would you look at that, 11 days away. This episode brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Make every moment more. This summer, FanDuel's hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone, including college football. Football every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Arizona's not making the Big 12 championship game. I don't think that. Somebody else does. Max Chadwick, a pro football focus, will be here. And Auburn's going to be a little bit better than most of you probably think. But first, that's Drake Toll locked on Big 12 joining me on the show. Is this crazy Uncle Kyle, Drake, because he's kind of a lame duck head coach. I think this is going to be his last season at Utah, so he doesn't have to deal with the ramifications of these comments because he'll fade out of the public light. If not after this season, then after next season, you would think, having named his head coach and waiting. Yeah. He is said to uh, 365, he has said to John Canzano that he feels like there's a major realignment move coming. What is he talking about? Uh, Kyle Whittingham says a lot of things. They're not always bad. He's he's a little on the poppy side, but also isn't the guy who's using social media every day. He's not Lane Kiffin. He's not trying to drum up a bunch of drama. So I usually try to give a little bit more to Kyle Whittingham. Uh, I also think he's more strategic than what you get out of Stillwater. Mike Gundy will go to the podium knowing he's going to make a headline, knowing that his ta- like I I see it as when we got to Big Twelve Media Days, Gundy saw Whittingham across the table. Is like you know what. DUIs aren't that bad. It's like, oh, great, Mike. Yep. You yeah, that was a decision. That was, that that was a decision. Be like, yeah, four or five beers. I do that all the time. Probably thousands of times. Like, yep, Gundy, you've got the spotlight again. Um, Whittingham, a lot of these conversations date back 10 years to like, I, there was a Bleacher Report article uh, that I stumbled upon today doing some, and I was studying how crazy is crazy Uncle Kyle. And there was tension within the program 10 years ago where he was saying some stuff about Utah and they thought they're going to part ways. And then, you know, he named a coach in waiting uh, prior, like Scally was named their guy around 2020 and then was not the guy anymore. Now he's their guy again. And then a couple of months ago, he comes out and says, I don't even know, but we'll be playing BYU in a few years because of expansion. And then when they say, hey, you're playing Miami in 2027, what do you think? And he's like, I won't be here. Great. The dude is just really transparent about things and he believes that the sec and the big 10 are going to create super conferences and maybe leave the ncaa and create their own playoff system and look we just got the ap poll which is in essence the sec and big 10 power rankings let's just uh, yes the uh, it, it very it very much is pretty much what you get there's no Tulane hanging around there there's no app state there's nothing I there's zero group of four five six however many of the conferences there are schools that exist in there 16 of the teams i believe it is come from the big 10 of the sec that's a lot of the teams and what he saying those two powerful conferences are becoming even more powerful and have such a gap between them the big 12 and the acc that they don't really have a reason to stick around and the ncaa is flubbed like they the recent lawsuit where the ncaa had just egg all over its face and is now costing those universities a lot of money because of it is something that the SEC and Greg Sankey don't want to put up with it anymore. Tony Petita doesn't want to put up with it anymore, and they might not have to. Kyle Whittingham, good foresight here. I, I don't disagree with him, though it's kind of wild to come from a Power 5 head coach. It is, and I thought it was notable that Dennis Dodd of CBS Sports had a response to that comment that if you know Kyle Whittingham is right, Dennis was saying, well, then you can just tear up all these media rights contracts that everyone just signed that run into the late 2020s or usually into the early part of the 2030s, which, yes, is indeed uh, about a decade or so from now. The idea of a super conference has been floated around before. And to your point on the AP poll, uh, why don't I just go through the top 15 here? I could go to the top 25, but I think top 15 makes the point. SEC, Big Ten, Big Ten, SEC, SEC. Uh, Notre Dame, Big Ten, Big Ten, ACC. Hey, look at, oh, that's Florida State. They're not going to be in the ACC for very long. Uh, SEC, Big 12, go Utah, I suppose. And then, uh, SEC and then ACC. Oh, yep. Clemson again. Yeah, they're, they're not going to be there anymore. And SEC. That's the top 15 teams. And this idea that they break away. Look, I see how it can work. I think the drawbacks are far greater yeah. than the benefits 
such a proposal would bring to college football and bring to college football fans. I am not a fan of the G5 having an automatic bid to the playoff because I don't think anybody should have an automatic bid to the playoff. But what I worry about, barring the introduction of a relegation promotion system, which I would be in favor of if they went to this model, I think you are suddenly pulling away from certain teams, leaving brands behind, and we're going to pick the 40 to 60 most watched or most profitable football and universities that were that we like and I think there are a lot of negatives with that. Yeah, this this is the same to me, the same reason we won't see relegation in college football is the same reason we won't actually see them break away from the NCAA. And Tear. that is because of the hoops you got to jump through, the red flags that come with that, the red tape that the NCAA puts up with all the time, the Title IX offices to try to work through revenue deals. And, and I just don't think the SEC is ready to be the governing body of 16 or 30 or 40 schools when it comes to not just football, but swimming and rowing and track and field there's still so many sanctioned sports where you go hey the ncaa has got a ton of offices and people that are in charge of these things that handle all of that for you you sign the paperwork and you submit it to the ncaa and that section of your sport is done you the head coach have reported x y and z to the ncaa now you have to do that to the sec office it's not built for that that's not built to be the governing body of all of college football all of college softball all of college basketball there is too much you would have to completely reset how you lead it in relegation you have to completely reset how you structure your conferences and what that looks like and how travel looks and scheduling looks there's just too much that those conferences aren't going to want to deal with so it, the idea of the big 10 and the sec creating their own playoff i don't know if that's that for him they've got a good amount of control under right where charlie baker is his whole in, in his meetings in the last six months with those conference commissioners has really been hey you guys in paying student athletes here, like we're going to give you guys a lot of leeway and autonomy. I wouldn't be shocked if we moved to a different playoff format that really highlights those two conferences. But as far as them leaving the NCAA, Charlie Baker has given them a whole lot of power to try to keep them. And I think it's going to work. I hope it works because I, I don't want to see a breakaway where you leave not just the group of five teams entirely behind. Cause if I'm being honest, that's less of my priority, but that you would leave power four schools behind that the big oh, yeah. 10 would say hey if we're building a super conference we're gonna we're gonna bring these these four new kids on the block with us and um yeah indiana illinois northwestern purdue yeah. we don't really we don't really want you anymore and the sec will say yeah mississippi state and vanderbilt and uh missouri and whoever else we don't you know we don't we don't really we don't really want or, or need you here like that that's that's what I ward against. But I, I want to close with this, Drake, because you brought up a good point about why you give Kyle Whittingham's comments serious weight because he is a lame duck, so he doesn't have to deal with you know the consequences to think about uh, all, all these sorts of things. But this is not just something he said once and it just kind of went out there and I was like, whoa, what a quote. He has said this twice, that he believes a major realignment shift is coming in the next couple of years. And I tend to be in your camp, uh, w which is, correct me if I'm wrong, there are too many hurdles to jump over in the short term. I do think by, if you want to go way into the future, the middle of the 2030s decade, approaching yeah. 2040, by then, if you told me, yeah, we have two super conferences, everyone's a part of it, and they're divided up into divisions, that I would believe. Yeah, for sure. And and even past 2031, when we start to get more clarity on these TV deals, there's the possibility you see conference realignment almost merge into that without the actual, hey, we're trying to be a super conference. You just see the attrition build something like that. And that might be how we get there eventually. Uh, I will wrap by saying I think Kyle Whittingham is one of the great football coaches that exists right now and is someone that we overlook very often in the national conversation because he's been at Utah so long, even past them being in a power conference. And then when they were, he was really good. And we still didn't talk about him very much. We should talk about him more. And guess what? He doesn't really care. And if, if, if I, I, he's the kind of guy that tomorrow you're like, hey, Kyle, guess what? Utah, out of the Big 12. You're an independent now. He'll go, okay, I quit. <laughs> he, he's just, he's chill, man. He's yeah. like, whatever happens, it's out of my control. He's, he's like, all right, cool. And that's why I think Kyle Whittingham isn't BSing us right now. This is really what he believes. I, I don't know if he's that far off. Drake Toll, locked on Big 12. Great stuff today. Great energy as always. Perhaps the thing I like most about you, along with your cherry red tomato face. I don't know what you were I doing am earlier. Um, you, are, you, have a, you have a little... It's in this area. Round, I'm blushing for the round, ladies. Round here. 
Yeah, let's let's roll with that. Uh, I'm rolling with Arizona is not going to win the Big 12 or make the Big 12 championship game, but Max Chadwick of Pro Football Focus vehemently disagrees. And uh, yeah, we're going to air out such grievances next. This episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop, and I want college football to be here already. As the playoffs have wound down, we've gotten fewer and fewer sports, but the good news is FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets literally anytime I'm in the mood. That's right. It's that simple. And they have everything you want for college football. Win totals, games, national title odds, Big Ten title odds. I mean, it's it's all over there. It is a cornucopia of college football gambling. And this summer, FanDuel's hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com, start making the most out of your summer and what is left of it as college football approaches. FanDuel.com, FanDuel official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. I will not pick Arizona to win the Big 12 for a couple of reasons. But Max Chadwick, joining me here of Pro Football Focus, is going to do just that, or at least he has done just that. So, Max, I'll get to why I'm down on Arizona compared to some. They're a preseason top 25 team, number 21 in the AP poll. I think that's fine. I don't know if they end up there by the time the season comes to a close because I don't think their schedule works out in very favorable fashion to wind up in the top 25. I don't think it's that favorable of a Big 12 schedule either. But when you look at Arizona's team and all that they lost from last year, there are some key returners, no doubt about it. But they lost a good chunk from that 10-3 and football team from a season ago. Why do you like them this year? Honestly, they return so much talent still, man. I mean, they bring back Noah Fafita, who, in my opinion, is a top 10 quarterback in the country. They bring back Tetsuro McMillan, who is, at worst, the second best receiver in the country. I think it's a very good argument for him to be number one ahead of Luther Burton the third. So you have him. Uh, you bring back Takario Davis at corner, who's a top 15 pick, I think, in next, the next year's draft. He's an absolute freak athlete. The next Tariq Wollin, in my opinion, uh, top five corner in the country as well. Uh, you bring back a lot of guys in that secondary, too, that I really like. Like Gunnar Maldonado at safety is a really good player. Trey Dan Stukes at slot corner is a really good player as well. So they bring back Jonas Savainea at right tackle. He's, he might be a first-round pick at right tackle as well. And they added some talent in the portal, too. You know, Jacory, losing Jonah Coleman at running back is a huge loss. He's one of the best running backs in America. But Ja'Cory Krosky Mayer was one of the highest-graded running backs in the country this past season uh, while at New Mexico. So I think he's going to be at least a good player for them, and the drop-off won't be as severe losing Jonah Coleman. Uh, and they bring back some other guys defensively too, like Kevin Darton uh, from Syracuse at the tackle really can help out that run game and pass rushes too. So I'm, I, I think the big 12 is wide open and that's why I'm still going out of their talent. But uh, I do understand some of the weaknesses, you know, with new coaching staff. I don't love Brent Brennan, the new coach they got from San Jose state. Uh, obviously as a Syracuse fan, Dino Babers, uh, has, we have had issues with him in the past too. He's the new offensive coordinator at Arizona, but just looking at the talent, man, and the superstars they bring back, uh, I think they are right now the best team in the Big 12. I like their high-end talent. It's hard to not like Noah Fafita and Tetsuroa McMillan because I, I agree on the top 10 quarterback at least in all of college football. We'll see what he does this year. T-Mac as a top two wide receiver and maybe even not number two. I, I can get on board with that suggestion as well going into the year. There are some talented guys that are going to start playing in college football that can push for it, but T-Mac has lived up to the billing as the highest rated recruit in the history of Arizona football. But I look at last year's team, and they lose a good tight end. They lose a good running back. They lose an NFL offensive lineman. They lose a good corner. They lose a couple pieces along the defensive line. Those are questions that that I have and why I think they pull back a little. I don't think their schedule is really favorable, and I'll predict their record here in, in just a moment. But the other thing, Max, is Brent Brennan is an unknown to me, and I think it's really hard to come in as a new coach and win a conference championship in a league where, yes, it's wide open, but it's also wide open in the Big 12 because there are so many teams that can win the conference championship. I have my Big 12 conference title prediction as being Utah against Kansas with Utah coming out on top. I think Kansas' schedule, I, I do wish they played home games, just like I wish it was still Jed Fish down in Tucson rather than Brent Brennan because I, I saw him elevate a Mountain West program at San Jose State beyond what it had ever really been in my lifetime. He deserves full faith and, and credit for that. I still haven't seen him coach against everybody he's going to go up against in the Big 12. Could he play Utah early in the season on the road, come back and beat him in the Big 12 championship game? I don't know. And that's the other question that I have about the Wildcats. 
That's very fair. And that is, that is to me, the biggest question is Brent Brennan, honestly, at, at head coach. And, and head coaching matters in college football way more than it does uh, in the NFL, right? So that, I think that is an issue. But, I mean, the schedule, man, I actually – you look at the power rankings for PFF, the strength of schedule – Arizona has the second easiest schedule in the Big 12 right now. At no, overall. I need to speak. Can I speak with your manager, please? 68th overall, man. I'm just saying this schedule uh. is not as brutal as you might think it is. I, don't, I really don't think it's that bad. And also, mm. I mean, I think of the Big 12 overall, man. And like, yeah, there's a lot of teams that can win it. But also just means like there are a lot of good teams in the Big 12. Like, I don't think there's a truly like great team. In the oh, Big I agree. 12. Like, I, agree. I think – all the Big 12 teams, besides I mean, Arizona, I think is a top 15 team. But other than that, I think you got you know guys teams that would fall in the 16 to 40 range, right, yeah, in the Big 12. So I'm not all in on any of the Big 12 teams really outside of Arizona. Even with Arizona, I see I still see their negatives. But they're really – I mean, you look at any other Big 12 team, like I tell you, glaring weaknesses of any other team in the Big 12 as well. So um, I, that's why I'm – there's not really the team in the Big 12. There's not really the team in the ACC either. That's why I'm like, yeah, if you're going to make a pick, I think Arizona's a really good one. Okay. Well, I'm going to go game by game here and okay. give my prediction. Going into this season, I reserve the right to change from week of the game <laughs> if I feel differently, of course. But at the moment, this is where I pick Arizona's schedule to be and how I see them going 8-4, and four, which, by the way... I could frame as overachieving their win total seven and a half. It opened at eight and a half, which, which is I insulting. thought was absurd. Seven, uh, seven and a half is insulting. That, and that to me, like I would set the total at eight and a half, nine and a half, maybe, and I still would take the over on that. I would say so. Mm, uh, seven mm, and big a half. Big confidence. Dude, if you, big if confidence. You, if you're a betting man, seven and a half is the best bet to make this off. I cannot believe the win totals out. It's one of them. I take Georgia over ten and a half. I don't think the Bulldogs are going to have two yeah. regular season losses. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I, I don't see that happening. Here's how I think Arizona's schedule plays out. They open with NAU. That's a win at Kansas State at Utah. The Kansas State game is not a Big Twelve conference game. It's a non-conference mm -hmm. matchup. It's in Manhattan. I think Kansas State wins. I think they lose at Utah. Then stack up a couple wins with Texas Tech and BYU. One of my upsets of the year in the Big 12 is Colorado going into Tucson and beating the Wildcats for their third loss of the year. I think they beat West Virginia. Then on the back half, I think they will beat Houston. I think they will beat Arizona State. I don't think they'll have real problems with either of those teams. But I am projecting a split in the road games with UCF and TCU, I think the UCF game is more likely, but I don't hate TCU's offseason. I think Andy Avalos comes in and is a really good defensive coordinator to help the Horn Frogs on that side of the ball. I think they bounce back after they had their fallback year. So those are two tough road games. If you gave me UCF and TCU at home and Houston ASU on the road, I'd feel pretty good about saying Arizona can go 4-0 in that stretch. But in those final four games of the year, I think they will lose one of those two. And it's not as much a knock against Arizona as it is a credit to what the other teams have done this offseason with things that I like. That's how I think they wind up at 8-4. and K-State, Utah, Colorado, and a little bit of a surprise, which happens every year, by the way. Everybody's got a surprise. Well, not everybody. Georgia does it. But UCF or TCU, where am I wrong? I think... I think eight and fours, I wouldn't go with that. I would say 10 and two is the ceiling. I don't think they go any higher than that. I don't think they go 11 and one or 12 and no. I think I'm probably, 10 is just the ceiling. I'm between nine and three and 10 and two for the team right now. I think they're going to split one of the K State Utah games, most likely to be K State. I think at Utah, I mean, Utah is one of the best home field advantages in the sport. Like, I, I just think. Yeah. So they're probably going to lose that game. As long so as Cam Rising stays on the field. Like Cam Rising is taken off the field with an injury again, that of course changes yeah. the dynamic. Exactly. So I think I'll say they beat K-State, lose to Utah. I don't hate the Colorado pick. Um, I, I do think Colorado's a lot better than some people might think. They address their weaknesses hard this offseason. Very hard. Very, they very did a hard. Great job getting the D line better. They got some new pieces on the O line as well. The new receivers I really like too. A new corner and Preston Hodge is really good. Uh, a new some new linebackers, so they really address their their weaknesses. So I think that could be an interesting one. I don't hate that. West Virginia is going to be a tough game. Uh, UCF so is going to be a tough game. So yeah, I, I think nine and three is what I'm probably projecting. But I think uh, ten and two overall is probably what I would say. But I wouldn't be surprised if they go nine and three. I think anything less than nine and three should be seen as disappointment for Arizona. Um, so I would say nine and three and ten and two is probably the two records. I would, I would say is most likely for that team right now. 
I can see nine and three. It's not unreasonable. All these games could play out exactly how I think, but they beat Colorado or they, you know, yeah. go and up, upset Kansas State. They're an eight and a half point dog in Manhattan week two, and I think they should be because I think Kansas State is a, is a good team. Sounds like Max is going to open up the old uh, pocketbook I'll there. Open up the, I'll yeah. open up the wallet, yeah. I'll Fanduel.com. Wallet that. That's the link, Mac, Max. <laughs> Fanduel.com. They've got stuff for – for everybody over there, do not forget. Well, disagree, though, uh, we may. Max Chadwick, Pro Football Focus. Always enjoy the chat, my man. College football, as this show releases, is 11 days away. How great is that? What? Max, thanks for the time. Thanks, Max. Uh Auburn is going to surpass your expectations. That might depend on what your expectations are, Ooh. but they're going to beat FanDuel's expectations. Tell you why, coming up next. First, this episode brought to you by friends at eBay Motors, passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. They have superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and so much more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, eBay Motors has got everything you want, and you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back, because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Auburn's going to overachieve this year, depending on what you think they're capable of achieving. That is Zach Blackerby locked on Auburn joining me here on the show. I'll say right at the outset, Zach, I think this is an eight and four Auburn football team. And after last year, six and six, six and six, a loss in the bowl game. I I think most people are kind of like, ah, it's Auburn. That's kind of what they are. But I look at the moves they've made. I look at Hugh Freeze's track record as a head coach. The fact that they were a fourth and 31 away from being a seven and five team, which feels a little bit different. Maybe it's a different bowl game. Maybe they win eight games. The margins were pretty slim. So as long as Peyton Thorne is capable, competent, decent. I think this Auburn team can go eight and four. The schedule is not horrible. No, it's the easiest schedule Auburn's had in a long time, in in a long time. And so I think they're going to kind of benefit like most SEC West teams or former SEC West teams with this new version of the SEC, the schedule is going to get easier. So we'll see what that looks like. But there are several reasons to think that Auburn can go eight and four. I'm with you for a big chunk of the offseason. I wavered back and forth depending on what kind of mood I woke up in. If Auburn was a seven and five team or an eight and four team, and I think they're going to be an eight and four team when it's all said and done this upcoming year. I'm still kind of bouncing around on who those four losses are because I think there's arguments for for a few of them there. But Auburn has done everything they possibly can this off season to make it not about the guy you mentioned, to make it not about Peyton Thorne. You go out and get Cam Coleman. Perry Thompson, Bryce Kane, and Malcolm Simmons. They call them the Freeze Four, four true freshmen that are exceptional, Spencer. They they have – you always stand next to these athletes, and it's like you, you're watching practice or whatever, then one of them walks by, and you point, and you say, that's different. That looks different. And, and Auburn hasn't had a class of receivers like this arguably ever. So we'll certainly see what kind of impact they make as true freshmen. We're all expecting Cam Coleman to do it. I think Perry does. I think Malcolm does. I think Bryce has a chance. He's more of a slot guy, and there's more slot receivers on this roster. But they went out and got those guys. They got Keandre Lambert-Smith, who who I think you thought – I think you think pretty highly of him. They got him from Penn State. Mm -hmm. Robert Lewis, a very skilled and talented receiver from Georgia State. Uh, There's a lot to like. They made the offense not as much about Peyton Thorne. It's easier to play quarterback now at Auburn than it was a year ago, and that's important. And I'm a big Jarquez Hunter fan. Big, big fan. I I think the balance that Auburn can have offensively with that offensive line could be really good and allow Peyton Thorne to only need to play complementary football. Now, does Peyton Thorne factor into the ceiling I put on this Auburn team, which is 9-3? and Yes. Yeah, he absolutely does. If you put a better quarterback into this Auburn system and on this team in 2024, I think Auburn ceiling could be 10 and two. 
I don't know if I could get him to go over the hump and, and beat Bama or, or Georgia this year, even with a better quarterback, but I would be more inclined to pick nine and three if the quarterback situation were different as yeah. it is. I think it's enough. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned Auburn's schedule kind of being, I think it's interesting. Um, but when you look at nine and three, if those are the right three losses and things go kind of weird in the top 10, Auburn's got an outside shot of at least being in the conversation to be a playoff team this year. Uh, I, I don't think a nine and three team in, gets in there. In the I conversation, think, sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I was careful with my wording there. So are <laughs> they 15th or 16th? That probably gets you in the conversation. It gets you on the graphic of who's left out whenever, whenever they do the, you know, the, the broadcast of, you know, who's in. So, and I think that's all Auburn can ask for right now. You got to take baby steps and the way Hugh Freeze has built this because he chose to invest more in this high school class that are now true freshmen than he did in his second transfer portal class because he wants to build with these guys and he's got the talent on the roster to do that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, nine and three would be an exceptional year. I, I still think Auburn goes eight and four, Spencer, and it sounds like you do as well. But if if something goes the right way, if something goes the right way and Auburn can close out games kind of like they weren't able to do a year ago, 9-3 to three is certainly on the table. The reason I look at this schedule and say 8-4 and four is really, really within the realm of possibility and what my uh, official prediction is here, there are two games that, that kind of trip me up, and we'll get to that in just a sec, okay. is Auburn plays their first five games at home. And... The ability, I'm a big routine guy, Zach, big routine guy. I'm a routine guy on the golf course. I'm a routine guy when I wake up in the morning. I'm a routine guy when I go on the same vacations every year. I love routine. The ability for those players to be in the same routine, to not have to travel for over a month, I think is huge to have the home cooking factor. I think they're beating Cal week two, who's a solid ACC team, by the way, but Auburn is not going to. Your your Cal? Your favorite team, in my Cal, football? my my California Golden Bears are this not is going to go. Cal, isn't it? It is. Uh, that okay. C uh, O L L E G E, and then football is actually just Cal. You know, with, right. with, with with a word jumble and such. That's I think right. four and O is an expectation for Auburn, and five and O is a goal. I think they're going to win that game against Oklahoma because it'll have such a rinse and repeat feel to it. And I think Oklahoma is a good team. I think Auburn's also a good team. I have questions about both, but I have more questions about Oklahoma's roster and questions about Auburn's quarterback. But you put the Tigers at home, Hugh Freeze in year two. If this was Brent Venables year three and Hugh Freeze year one, I'd probably go Oklahoma even at Jordan-Hare. But Hugh Freeze year two and Jackson Arnold, that's going to be a big-time test for him. I, I think Auburn wins and starts the season 5-0. and Yeah, and I, I think either – outcome for Oklahoma the week prior when they host Tennessee it'll be their first SEC game ever I think if they win against Tennessee the emotions are so high I think if they lose there's a chance the emotions are so low and there's almost pressure where I think there's a real chance Oklahoma starts 0-3 in conference play and almost becomes a fear of like being a meme of being a joke a laugh the laughing stock of the SEC it's like you wanted this for so long and you lose to Tennessee, you lose to Auburn, and then you lose so to Nebraska Texas. to the Big Ten sort of move is what the feel would be. Like, wait, are we just going right. here and going to just sit in mediocrity forever? Yeah, and I don't think Oklahoma's going to do that. Me I neither. think Venables is a good coach, and I, I think their first th their, their draw of this schedule, the SEC was nicer to Texas than they were to Oklahoma, and I don't think anybody that's going to – I think Texas people would agree with that. They probably think it's hilarious. I would too. I don't blame them. But I think the pressure is on Oklahoma – and this is a game for a big chunk of the offseason. I said, ah, I, I think Auburn drops this one. As we get closer and closer to the season, I think Auburn's got a real shot in this one. No question about it. I think if they win this game, Auburn that is, it'll be the first for a, a lot of Auburn fans maybe that kind of tune in and out with the football season. That'll be the first time their ears perk up and like, beat who? Did, five did, and oh, did five what? and oh going five, into five, Athens five, to take on yeah. Georgia. Five and oh going to Athens. Okay, I think Georgia's going to win that football game. I apologize if I'm uh, breaking any news here to Auburn fans. I think Georgia yeah. is a loss. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and come back to those two games in the middle. I think Vanderbilt's a win. Louisiana Monroe is a man. I think Texas A&M's a loss. 
I like Connor Wigman. I like Mike Elko. Jordan Hare is tough. Everybody knows that. I, I think Texas A&M gets it done that week, and they lose the Iron Bowl. So those are three losses that I put on uh, on the schedule here. Alabama, Texas A&M, and Georgia. I think Auburn's season and, and how successful it'll be viewed at the end of it gets defined in consecutive weeks with back-to-back road games to Columbia to take on Missouri, to Lexington to take on Kentucky. My gut tells me, Zach, this is a win-one, lose-one for Auburn. I go back and forth on which one that is. I think Missouri is good. I don't think Missouri is great. I don't I don't buy them as an SEC title contender. I think Kentucky is decent. They've been decent the last several years. They've pushed Georgia before. Certainly they could win this game at home against Auburn. What's your feeling on these two games? Yeah, Missouri is so interesting because, I mean, they lost so much on the defensive side of the ball. I think their offense is going to be respectable. But when they play a team that can hold their own on the defensive side of the ball, which I do think will be Auburn this year. What does that look like? What does that look like? And I think they're going to have a hard time stopping the run. I think that's going to be one of the strengths of Auburn's offense this upcoming season. And so could that be a mismatch on the road? Missouri should be around the top 10 team at that point of the year because I think a lot of their stuff happens afterwards. I think they go to Alabama the week after they host Auburn. And before that, they're going to UMass, which is odd. Auburn has a bye week going into that game. I think there's a lot of variables where you can say, yes, this makes sense for Auburn. Kentucky, I don't know what kind of home field advantage Kentucky has. Like, I I know that they've been fine under Stoops, but they don't typically beat good SEC teams or teams that finish with a winning record in the conference. Is Auburn in that territory this year? I think they're going to be right around it. I think they're going to be a 4-4 and or a 5-3 and team in the conference, and Historically, under Stoops, Kentucky doesn't win those types of games. They're good at beating bad SEC teams, and it's been able to prop up their record because the former SEC East stunk outside of Georgia for the vast majority of Stoops' run, and they really were able to benefit from Tennessee and Florida being down historically over the last half decade. And so to me, I don't really respect Kentucky a ton, uh, we'll, we'll see We'll see what happens when they go to Lexington. But I think both of those games are winnable. The big question to me is, like, Auburn wasn't the same team away from Jordan-Hare Stadium last year unless it was when they were playing a bad Arkansas team and when they were playing a bad Vanderbilt team. What does that look like this year? They should be better than a year ago, Spencer. Should. 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 That's why we play the games on the field, though, Zachary, yeah. because it's way more exciting to then compare your predictions actually on the field. We're not running an EA College Football 25 simulation here. Real, honest-to-goodness football starts in 11 days. Is that the oh. greatest thing you've ever heard? I don't know if it's the greatest thing I've ever heard, but it, 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 it that felt good. That felt good, the sensation that you just gave me. Thank you. I am glad that I could provide that for you. Zach Blackerby, Locked On, Auburn. And just for clarification purposes, I think Auburn splits – the Missouri-Kentucky games. Win one, lose one. I think they could win either game. I think they could lose either game. I'll go one and one. Auburn, eight and four. And I think that's a darn good second season for Hugh Freeze and company. Zach, also landing in the eight and four sort of range. Yeah. We could look sharp. We could look dumb. But whatever we do, we will do it together. That's right. Uh, real quick, tell me tell me your thought process on the loss to a and I think the Texas A&M roster, despite their departures is still incredibly talented. And Mike Elko is a guy who has been doing less with or more with less for the last couple of years. He's got a starting quarterback in Connor Wigman who has experience. He hasn't, you know, logged a full season under his belt, but he's going to have capable quarterback play. I think they're going to have enough. I don't love the running back injury. I, I, I definitely don't run that love that. However, at the end of the year, they'll have had the chance to figure out what their rotations are, establish their ground game, as long as they are just solid in the trenches and Auburn's not overwhelming them on either side of the ball. I think Elko is as good of a coach schematically as Hugh Freeze is, and it's one of the reasons I like Auburn, but I think that Texas A&M game is, is just tough enough, but I think it'll be a heck of a battle. Sure, sure. All, uh, all viable arguments there I, I just i don't think that's one if auburn goes eight and four i don't think that's one of the losses i think i think it's bama georgia i think oklahoma is more likely to be a loss than a&m 
And then I think it's one of those road games that you mentioned between Missouri and Kentucky. So we're close. Yeah, yeah, We're close yeah. on our prediction. I, I would, think we disagree we on A&M more than anything else. I, w- I would think that about Oklahoma if they didn't have a new offensive line with essentially a brand new quarterback. Wigman's got more experience than Jackson Arnold. So early in the year, like if you put that Oklahoma game later First in the season. road game at Jordan like Hare Stadium. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 uh, that's. That's tough. That is Zach Blackerby. Never tough doing a segment with him. Locked on Auburn. Zach, always appreciate it. Love you a long time. Appreciate everyone listening. Love you a long time too, boss man. I will see you all next time. And until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.